all of you are working on the same side, basically the same set of parameters. Usually the shape and uh, the geometry of the building, the function of the building dictates what material you use. You might uh, have a concrete building for residential, mid-rise, high-rise, or steel building for something of this nature. When I look at this, my first impression is that let's limit our conversation here to steel construction. Uh, you can conceive of a project that is made of uh, all concrete, but uh, for the sake of today's presentation, we will limit ourselves to steel mid-rise uh, steel frame building. Okay, and we go through some of the we go through some of the rules of uh, how to size members. How to, where to locate them, what issues you think about when you are placing a column or a beam or how deep it has to be, some of those things. And we don't uh, go into discussion about the underground foundation issues. We are basically limiting, because our time today is limited, we are limiting ourselves to the portion of the building that's above ground, okay? Before I start, is there any specific thing that you guys want to kind of like me to go in that direction, talk about that direction? Is there any specific, do they, do you have like, like uh, previous years, do you have extensive set of ramps in the building and uh, structures that, you do, okay. What about tall uh, perimeter walls, glass, perimeter walls, you know, something that kind of like showcase the building, or it's just the same, you know what I'm saying? Um, when you look at the pictures of the tall building that uh, Carol showed earlier, you see a building with regular facade, columns, walls. Sometimes you have buildings that have really tall glass facade. Like you go on Market Street, Four Seasons Hotel has very tall glass facade. Those are special issues. We will talk about some of them time permitting. Okay, primary structural system. I started talking a little bit of, uh, about this issue on during our 320 class last time. The structural system has basically these elements. Floor framing system, how you, fr uh, basically framing the floor means that what is the sequence, uh, what's the placement of beams, girders, floor deck, where do they go, what size they are. And then columns, sometimes we need long span systems like trusses, we will talk a little bit about those, and ramps and the stairs, perimeter cladding walls, and finally lateral force resisting systems. We are not going to talk about all these topics today, even though we are limiting our conversation to the steel. Typical floor framing system. <clears throat> Generally for a steel building, we have a floor deck that consists of metal deck with some kind of concrete fill on top of that. That provides for a couple things. Has a high load bearing value, so you can have like public uh, or residential use, you, know, you can uh, accommodate with this type of floor system. The other thing that's more significant is that it gives you the fire rating that you want uh, for the building. It is very relatively simple with this system to increase fire rating. Uh, one hour fire rated uh, system would typically consist of a concrete slab that is total thickness five and a quarter inch. If you want to increase the fire rating to two hour, all you need to do is to add one more inch of concrete to this floor and you get two hour fire rated system. Three hour fire rated uh, floor, add one more inch, seven and a half inch thick slab provides you the a higher fire rating. So you see this is very practical. You don't need to change your design too much. So, uh, some of the public spaces, theaters, assembly rooms, they need higher, a higher fire rating. And this system is ideal to accommodate that type of uh, fire rating. The metal deck and concrete floor, they provide the fire rating and they also have really high load bearing capacity. Anywhere from 100 pounds per square foot to 200 pounds per square foot. 
added load on the slab that accommodates all kinds of assembly loading requirements. Okay? The problem, the limitation, not the problem, the limitation of this system is that this deck by itself cannot span very long. 13 feet, 12 feet, 12 and a half feet maximum. So I need to add something to support that deck. That generally consists of a set of parallel beams. So you have a lot of beams. These beams, the distance between these beams, uh, uh, the distance between these beams that are running east-west in this picture is based on the spacing, the capacity of my deck. So here what I have written is that I need beams at 12 foot on center. Why 12 foot on center? It can be 10 foot on center, 12 foot on center. It's because of the, between this beam and its neighbor, there is that metal deck. And that metal deck cannot span more than 12 feet, okay? So these beams are the first set of elements that are supporting the floor. 12 foot on center is the distance from here to that wall probably. By the way, we talked about this term. I'm going to use it a lot. On center, what does that mean? It means that the distance from center of this beam to the center of the neighbor is 12 feet. That's a common nomenclature that we use in structural drawings and also in architectural drawings. 12 foot, 10 foot on center, 16 inches on center. <coughs> now that I have added these beams, I need a system to hold that beam up. You cannot afford to have columns at 12 foot on center. Then suddenly your building becomes full of columns. So in order to support these beams, we add a second set of elements that look like beams, but we call them girders. This girder is going now in the north-south direction. And their job is, this girder and this girder, their job is to support the beams. So this is the hierarchy. This is a simple, very simple rectangular plan. And I'm showing that just to uh, show you the sequence of metal deck in between beams that are at the spacings ranging from 10 feet to 12 feet, and then girders to support those beams. And obviously, you add columns to support them. This is, these are the ingredients of the floor framing system, but this is not the way I suggest you frame your floor. If you frame a floor like this, your buildings are just going to be simple rectangular structures for manufacturing, for uh, simple warehouse buildings. They are not going to be exciting buildings. Never locate your columns based on this rigid grid system. Look at your function. First, start with your architectural program. Look at the circulation, lighting. Look at what you want to create. First, start putting together your architectural plans. Once you have the architectural plan, then you come back and say, OK, I need to support this plan with a set of beams and decks. This floor does not have an opening. How do I create an opening in this slab? So here, uh, we talked about two issues. I need beams running one direction and girders running the other direction. And there is a distance between them. Distance from this beam to that beam, the distance from supporting girder to supporting girder. The second question is that, how large are these beams? Could it be a small beam? Do, they, do I need a very deep beam? There is a relationship between the span or how far a beam has to span between the supporting members and the depth of the beam. The longer the span, the deeper beam you need. This thin piece of paper is a spanning between two members. You sometimes make models with these thin elements, either thin plywood or a piece of cardboard, and say, oh, it makes sense, it is, uh, it is stable. 
This is not the way buildings function. This is only working, these small models, are, uh, they look stable because they are very small. There is a rule of uh, scaling. When you scale something 100 times smaller, like the typical eight of an inch scale, is approximately 100 times smaller than the actual structure. Then the loads on that model are 100 times less than the actual building. Imagine if I make an eight of an inch model and pile up a bunch of rocks on top of it to simulate the actual condition of the building. Then your model would not be stable. What I'm saying is that for actual buildings, what is important is the depth of the uh, members, either floors or beams. Whatever needs to span horizontally between two supports must have a depth. Okay. If you go to Architects Studio Companion, that's a good guide to have under your side, kind of like flip through that when you're doing your design. There are design charts, there are, there are design guides that give you rules of thumb, approximate rules how to size your members. And these uh, um, tables or charts are usually organized as span, as a relationship between the span and the depth of the member. The span being the distance between support and the depth being the total depth of the member. Okay, or if you have a white flange beam like this, depth is the total depth. The guide can be very complex, like they say for composite beams, there is a relationship, the longer the span, 30 foot span, you can have something in the range of 12 inches, maybe 14 inches deep. 45 uh, foot span, you need something deeper in the range of 20 inches. And differentiate between composite beams, regular beams, girders. I added these color lines on this graph to show the average. Never take, don't, we don't usually take the smallest value or the largest value. It is safe to take the average value. In my opinion, as simple and as useful as this chart is, it is still very complex. It's really for this level of architectural design that you want to do. What I recommend is going with a very simple rule. Choose the, you want to uh, size a beam, you say depth of the beam is a span over 20. If I have 20 foot span, 20 foot span, divide by 20, the depth is about one foot, 12 inches. That gives you approximately the uh, member that you want. Okay, and with that you can start placing your members and drawing your sections and see how it works. For the rest of this, let's go to the board and I have another marker for you in here somewhere. It's a little darker. So typical, sorry, this is, for typical floor, if I say the floor is, consists of in section, metal deck, and beams that are supporting that. Typical hash for concrete, metal deck, and the supporting beam. A section looking the other way, this would look like, that's the concrete deck part. This beam looks like a white flange beam, like this, right? <coughs> This beam at the end needs to be supported by uh, another member. So let's draw the girder that is supporting this beam. <coughs> so 
So what I have drawn here is a short section basically looking up at part of this beam and part of the girder. There are a lot of details how this beam gets connected to the girder. For the architectural design, don't uh, concern yourself. Don't waste too much time on that. What is important to keep in mind is the relationship between the beam and the girder. I drew the girder deeper than beam. Why? Why this bigger? Why do I need a bigger member? What's that? Supports more. Supports more. The girder, this beam is only supporting a small part of the floor. But that girder is supporting one, two, three, four beams. So it needs more strength. This is a structural decision. But right away, you can see that this has an impact on your architectural design. Why? Because this is where the architects have to combine all the different elements, structural, mechanical, everything has to come together. In a building, you have to place, you have to accommodate for circulation, for these ducts that bring air into the building, pipes, sprinkler lines, all of these things have to be accounted for, right? Especially, this is important when you're designing a public building, a theater, that a lot of people are going to be there, a lot of people are going to be breathing, so you need a lot of air circulation. If I put a duct here, let's say here is my ceiling, okay? Here is the ceiling, and a duct goes under the beam, everything is fine. It, everything is fine until that duct turns and wants to go the other way. Then it's going to hit the girder. These are some of the issues that you will encounter when you place the members. <coughs> Here I started drawing a, an option in some of these, for developing the floor framing of buildings, architects and engineers spend a lot of time talking about how much room they need for mechanical equipment. And for large buildings, sometimes we spend uh, time to come up with creative solutions. <coughs> For example, I might say to uh, an architect that I need such a deep uh, a, um, beam of so a certain depth, and then there is space needed for mechanical equipment underneath that and sitting down below. Sometimes it makes sense to use a deeper beam and cut holes in it in an efficient manner and pass the mechanical equipment through these members. All right? When you draw a section, in your next, uh, in our next time that we meet, we are going to review your projects individually. The first element that I'd like to see is that a realistic depiction of the thickness of your floor. That means I want you to account for how uh, deep the floor you need, and what is the reasonable depth of the beams that uh, you would require by that. This dimension, the depth of the beam and the floor, will affect your floor-to-floor -floor heights, your clear space, and this is a very important issue for your design. It has to be depicted on your drawings. So far we talked about the span has a relationship to depth. The second thing, this is a very important rule. You have a floor that you want to, I don't know, I'm just drawing something freehand. You want to support this floor with a set of beams. A floor or any part of it is like a table. To be stable, a table needs what? Legs, how many legs as a minimum? Four. So when you look at a portion of a building, and you say, okay, if this is a part, this needs at least four columns. Don't, don't leave a part of the building. Let's say, I, I have seen some of the students, they say, oh, I have a column here, I have a column here. What happens along the edge of the building? Well, I don't know, you know. Don't leave anything unanswered. Sometimes we can make cantilevers, but Everything starts from the realization that I need support for that corner. 
the easiest, the most direct way of supporting a part of a building is to come up uh, to place a column at that location. How many columns do I need along here? It depends on the size of your uh, floor. If this thing is only 30 foot wide, well, column here, column here, you can have a beam between them, and then you go to the rules of the depth of the beam is equal to span, a simple rule, divided by 20, 30 foot divided by 20, 30 feet divided by 20, right? That is one and a half foot or 18 inches. So I can have an 18 inch W beam here. That makes sense. What if this instead of 30 feet was 120 feet? Well, 120 feet, then depth becomes 120 divided by 20, that is six foot deep. That's a very deep member. I, I would lose a whole floor if I put a beam there. So you would break this space to a smaller, maybe three spaces at 30 feet on center, and you would put the regular beams between them. And you'd get two columns. You get two columns in between and one column at the corner. This thing about supporting every portion of the building with at least four columns applies if you have a hole in the building. A lot of buildings have atriums in them at the center. In structural drawings, when you see a sign like this, a part of the floor highlighted with the cross means that this part is open. The difference between structural floors and the architectural floors is that the structural floors always look down. So when you look at the floor, this is open. In architectural plans, you also show the buildings above, and sometimes you might have a dashed line that says open above. The structural floors do not show that part. If we have dash line, means that there is something under the floor. So the structural plans are always looking down. Unless it says reflected plan, which that means that it's looking up. Okay. A lot of buildings have openings, like atriums, uh, opening in the floor plan. If you go to, what's the uh, Emporium building on Market Street, there is a very elaborate round opening, right? Now, this is a hole in the slab. When you look at this, when you have a design issue like this, when you have a, you have to think about this floor needs to be supported. You have to come up with a logical way of supporting this. The simplest way is to place columns. at the grid around this, okay? How do I choose the spacing between columns? How do I decide how far apart they have to be? There is no mystery, there is, the rules are relatively simple. If you put two columns, there's going to be a beam between them, right? This beam, you have to think about, designing buildings is like putting together a three-dimensional jigsaw. Think about this space and uh, what you see here in three-dimensional, um, close your eyes and think of it three-dimensionally. Then you will see that this beam has to have a depth. Do you want a deep member? Can you live with a beam a member that is two feet, three feet deep? Or you want a shallow member? The depth of the, that member controls how far apart these columns have to be. You see what I'm saying? If I need, if I need, if visually, you need something that looks very, very narrow, not more than 12 inches deep, just this much. My depth here, I want to be 12 inches. What should be the 
spacing the distance between the columns? 20. Well, you can push this. Don't think this. Uh, don't take these numbers absolutely like word of God. 20, around 20. You can push it to 24. You can push it to 25. But don't go to 60. You see, well, don't change the order of magnitude. So this span becomes approximately 20 feet. I will say plus or minus. That's how you choose the spacing between your members. Start with where you want to put columns, and think about how deep a member you want between them. The depth that you choose for members, that is going to impact the floor to floor height, your ceiling uh, height, and all of those things depend on the depth of the member. Usually when you have a unusual corners like this, typically we expect to see a column at each corner. <coughs> Girders, and then you can start putting your beams in between them. So these beams can be at close spacing, 10 to 12 feet, to support the floor deck. And then you need a gird, larger girders. Girders to support these members. And six columns. And the columns. Oh, so you don't need, okay. Well, I, I'm not adding, uh, I'm assuming that these are like uh, dimensions that are 30, 40 feet so that you can have a reasonable size girder. Got it. Part of your design project involves adding a theater, right? A theater, apart from all the circulation issues that creates, has one specific requirement, and that is you do not want in a theater space, you do not want anything to interrupt or interfere with the sight line. You know, I could shoot a theater section right on that board and you can draw on top of it. Would you like that? Well, uh, I, I, yeah, that would be good, but let's start with something first. Okay. And then okay. think about this two ways. Number one, you start <coughs> laying out how you want to arrange your floor. This could be one arrangement for the seating, or there are other alternatives. The requirement is that you want every person, regardless of where they are sitting in this place, have a clear sight line to the stage. That means that no column in between. Additionally, you can think about this in section. If this is a, there's a stage here, and here is a floor that people are sitting. The person sitting at the top here, this person must have a clear view of the stage. You cannot have any part of the roof come underneath his view line. So, Sight line clearance is not only no column in between, also the structure above cannot interfere with the view. You don't want anything to interfere with the sight line of that person, okay? That forces your structure up. You cannot have anything poked below the sight line. The second thing is, now I need to support this floor. If I'll draw a hypothetical plan. If this is a plan, and this is that dimension that we said, the width uh, maybe 130 feet to 150 feet, I don't want any columns here. So that forces me, my columns are going to be that far apart. Minimum 150 feet apart. If I put a beam between these columns, 
what size beam do you expect for that? Based on the rule that I gave you before, depth equals the span divided by W78. You need something in the range of seven and a half feet deep. And th that becomes a large member, large heavy member, and you need a lot of them. Sometimes it's not practical to span such large spaces with such a deep beam. There is no circulation, and that member kind of like, you know, becomes very heavy pieces up here. That is not practical. So a lot of times, the other thing about beams is that beams are solid steel. You cannot pass through them. You cannot put ducts through them. If you have duct work here, as you can see here, they have a lot of duct work at the top. It is practical to put trusses here. What is a truss? Truss, for all practical purposes, functions like the rest of beams. It's a horizontal member that is spanning between columns. But instead of being a solid member, we remove material where it is not needed. Truss has a continuous top part and continuous bottom part. Top cord, bottom cord. Why does it need top, uh, continuous top and bottom cord? Top and bottom cord are the most important elements in a truss. The rest of the truss members are connecting them together. You cannot have a truss that is missing part of the bottom cord. It, this part has to be continuous. You can have a truss that the shapes are slightly different. The top cord can be bent, bottom cord can be straight. Alternatively, you can have a truss that the top cord is a straight, bottom cord bent, but they have to be continuous. All right, top and bottom cord, what are the other elements? The rest of the elements are in the truss are required to connect them together. There are a series of verticals, and then there are diagonal members that connect them together. So these are solid. <coughs> the rest is empty. So you can think about truss as a large, as a gigantic beam that I have removed material where it is not really doing a lot of work. By removing material, truss becomes lighter, practical, and also provides a functional use. I can now put the duct work inside the, I can pass them through these holes. A lot of large theaters, symphony halls, they have roof that is made up of truss. There are, if you just Google truss, you will see it, at least 100 different shapes. The pattern of the web members that I, these verticals and diagonals that I showed here, this is one particular pattern, but by all, no means this is the only pattern. You can have many different patterns, but all of them have basically the same features. Continuous top and bottom cord, then you have web members, a series of verticals and diagonals connecting them together. Some rules. How do I decide about the depth of this truss? If I need to put a truss here, let's say this section is looking at my space this way. If I put a truss here, I put a truss here, I put a truss here, how does that truss look uh, appear in this section? Well, the truss should be somewhere up here. The bottom cord, the top cord, and the web member. 
What about its neighbor? Its neighbor should be somewhere here. And then there is a, the last one just before the stage, there is a truss here. Truss, just like column, is one of the most important elements in the structure. So when you draw them, kind of in your graphics need to indicate their importance. The way we uh, indicate the importance of a member in our drawing is by the thickness of the line. The thicker the line that you use for a member means that it is more important. The darker line that you use means that it's more important. You cannot move it. So when you show trusses, try to use a dark line to indicate that there is a truss here. Don't use, I have seen some of the students, they spend a lot of time thinking about the placement of office and furniture and where the restaurant has to be, and they show the uh, all the dining room um, chairs, furniture, great detail. When it comes to trusses and beams and columns, they show the lightest line and they say, oh, there's a column here. That column is going to be much bigger, much heavier than everything else. So use a dark line to indicate that. How do I decide how deep the truss should be? If I have a 130 foot span here, how do I decide the truss? There. Just like just like beams, there is a rule. Instead of these are all rules of thumb. These are not uh, scientific. For the truss depth, you can appro say approximately span over twelve. Okay. This is different than beams. Beams are heavier solid because this one has a lot more holes. You need more depth. So for 130 foot, this becomes approximately 10 to 11 foot deep. But that is not the only requirement that is coming along. A lot of times in a space like this, we use truss space, the space up here for circulation, for duct work. Maybe you want to build a series of walkways. Walkways that are at the, in this space we call them catwalks. This is not for general public to go up there, for the service personnel to go and uh, install uh, lights. If you have a series of walkways, you want to size this so that a person can walk through here so the dimensions of a person will uh, come into effect. The size of the ductwork that you come, uh, that you're considering will come into effect. All of those can factor in sizing your trusses. Okay. So for long span areas, it is common to use trusses. I have placed trusses, because truss is such a, an important member, it is carrying a lot of load, it generally comes to a column. If there is a place that I cannot have a column, I will need a super strong member that goes to two columns so that a truss and a truss <coughs> Generally, as a first rule of thumb, try to have a column at the end of a truss. If there is a place that you cannot have a column, then plan for it by put, uh, allowing for a large, strong member there. Okay, is that enough to support this roof? Keep in mind the distance between these could be 30 feet, 40 feet, from this truss to that truss, there is 40 feet of slab. Slab by itself cannot span 40 feet. What do I need to support this slab? I need to have a series of beams. So common, it is very common between trusses, you have a series of beams. This space is 120 feet. How many beams do I need here? 
depends on the distance between them. Okay, if these beams are supporting the roof deck, and the roof deck ma can span maximum 10 feet. So the distance between these could be up to 10 feet, nine feet maybe. So you see, you need a lot of them. These are the components that go in a floor framing. Somebody might say, oh, I have a theater, but my theater is not rectangular. It is shaped like a narrow end here and a wider end here. Does that change the picture? Not really, it's just a variation. You still need column, column, truss between them, column, column, truss between them, and maybe a another series of columns and trusses in between. And then between them you start filling with floor beams or roof beams. So everything is just a variation on the same theme. I don't know in this case exactly what is the structure. Uh, from this uh, I cannot uh, really figure out if there, this part is open or this is the roof. But uh, I'm just going to assume that my roof is up here. And it looks like there is a... If I have in this picture, I have a truss member here. And I have a truss member here. How the rest of this uh, show between them, it could be a beam system between these trusses. So these are beams that are located between trusses. In section, you both see truss and beam and then the roof on top of it. In this plan, Where is a good place to put the column? In the sides. Well, obviously, starting from the edges of the building, these are good places to put columns, right? If I, one thing that we like to see in a structural plans you always need to see the edge of the building, okay? So if I show you this line, I'm sorry, what I'm, uh, I'm going to talk about might deviate from the actual plan of this uh, building. I haven't really studied this building to tell you for this plan, um, for this level, where is the actual slab, but I'm going to assume that this is the edge of the slab. Okay, there is a line here that indicates that there is a wall here. So this part might be an exterior part, like an exterior balcony. There is, but I want to see the edge of the slab, concrete floor, metal deck, all of these things, they come up to this uh, area. There is a stair here, so there is a hole in the slab here. There seems to be an exterior wall system somewhere here. Okay, so once I located where the holes are going to be, there is another hole in the slab uh, stair system here. There's elevator, that's uh, another hole in the slab. Once I have located this, now I can go and say, where are good places to put columns? I generally need columns at the corners of the buildings. If there is a member along this edge, and there is a member along this edge, this type of corner is always a good place to put a column. Every time you have two angles coming together, that's a good place to put a column. There is an open area for the stairs here. This might be a good place to put a column. This might be a good place to put a column. Between these, and here is another open space. 
between them, you want an open space here. So you can have columns that are below this floor to support the floor, but that column cannot come up to the floor to go and support the roof. So suddenly the plan tells you where these columns have to be and where the first long span truss system has to be. Okay, let's go beyond and say, where is the next place that I need a column? If I put the next column way back here and way back here, from here to there, I have a very long span. Long span means super deep members and a lot of load on that single column. It is better to distribute the load. So we put a series of columns And these columns tell us where the next members are going to be. These are the columns that are going up to the top of building and supporting the roof. What about the floor below? Am I limited only to these columns? You can have columns in between, but these columns do not come through the slab. They are just below the floor. So the truss system that we talked about, you need it for the roof, but you do not necessarily need it for the floor. Unless there is another public space, you want to have another long span open space below that theater. One of the most important rules about locating columns is that Columns work efficiently when they are continuous all the way down. They take weight from the roof, and at each floor, there are members framing into that. So the load comes from roof to the column. From every floor, load comes to the column. And this column goes all the way down and eventually sits on the foundation. So, it seems logical, you know, and when you see a table, the legs are going all the way down. Except that when you're drawing uh, architectural plans, the path is not that simple. You start from a uh, ground level. You think about how people enter the building, where they, how they walk around, if there is a store, if there is a bathroom, if there is an elevator. So you put down that plan. Then you go to second floor and you see there are offices. Then you go to third floor, there's a, you say that there is a theater. For each level, you are placing the structure, your columns and beams for that floor. And suddenly you put them together, you see that the columns are not lining up. The process of you know, structural designing a building is by its very nature iterative. You know what iterative means? You iterate. You start from one level, you go to the second level, you start putting columns and beams, then you go back to the first level again and say, okay, do these columns line up? If they're not lining up, you have to adjust them. Once you adjust those two, you go to the third floor, you draw that one, then you go down again. So this process has to, you constantly have to go up and down the building, adjusting the locations. Try to avoid try to avoid the situation that the column is disrupted. Does that mean there is no building with a disrupted column? No, it is possible to have a column disrupted and transfer its load to other columns. If you run into a situation like this, realize what you are doing is a special case. This is generally, there is A beam that is supporting a column, this is called transfer girder. It is a special member. We can use it in certain locations. 
if you don't abuse it, if you keep the loads limited, and because it has taken a lot of load, it's a deep and strong member. So we have to allow for enough room around it. So here is a floor. <coughs> and you can see that this floor, even in this architectural plan, there <coughs> are a bunch of columns down below. These columns naturally would not go through because if they go through, they will uh, limit the site view. But you can put beams and girders between these columns for supporting that floor down there. What are these things? What are, what are these things? Cantilevers. Cantilevers. Why this cantilever? Cantilever is a structure that is supported at one end. There is no support. This is a simple beam. Has two supports. Right? A simple beam needs two supports. If you have a simple beam and removal support, it falls down. Cantilever is a special beam that has one support. The way this has uh, is a special beam is because that end must be clamped hard so that if you put load on it, it doesn't fall down. Okay. These have to be cantilevers. Why? Because if I put a column out here, that column is going to ruin the sight line for people who are sitting behind it. So no column here. No column means that this whole area, the line diagram for this is a cantilever. This is a cantilever. This is the way we show the fixed support for a cantilever. But in reality, the support for cantilever is not a single point. In order to support that cantilever, that beam has to continue inside. This is supported here, but that beam has to continue inside. And always, you see, these cantilevers must have a continuation inside. general good rule of thumb is that your back span must be larger than your cantilever span. It is very difficult to have a cantilever. You see there's a wall and I have a cantilever coming out of this wall and there are so many people sitting here. This becomes very difficult. Okay, I'm going to come to that. So cantilever is a beam that is coming out like that. It needs a depth. It needs a depth. It cannot have, cannot be paper thin. We, for simple beams like this, we talked about a simple approximate, and I really stress this thing, this approximate. Depth approximately equal to span times 20. What about for cantilever? Does the same thing apply for cantilever? If you use this rule for a cantilever, you get a cantilever that is very flexible. How many of you swim? When you go to swimming pool, there is a diving board. Diving board is a cantilever. Why? A diving board is very flexible. You can jump up and down on it. 
why it is so uh, flexible is because diving board is very thin. If you don't want your floors, these balconies become like diving board, you need to provide more depth. So for cantilever, span over 10. Again, this is approximate. <coughs> now, Omar, you were saying about the, it has two supports. Why do they go to this? Imagine, I'm just going to take for sake of argument. Let's say this thing is 40 feet of cantilever span, okay? 40 feet of cantilever span, with this rule that I gave you, how deep should be the beam that is supporting this? If it is 40 feet cantilever, by this rule, four feet. Four feet, this is the height of the chair, based on the height of the chair, four feet is this much. So suddenly you see that you need really deep beams under here. What happens with these beams? These beams are get, cutting into the sight line of the people in front. So designing this cantilever is very delicate because just by simple rules, you are forced into using deep members. In order to avoid them, what they have used here is actually a structure that is looks like this. This is the structural system. And here too. The cantilever at its deepest point is about that ratio that I mentioned, but it gets thinner as it gets closer to the edge. And all of these are impacting the headroom clearance, the size of a person who stands here has an impact, the sight line has an impact. So this area is one of those issues that architects draw large sections and carefully look at the look at the sight lines and look at how much clearance they, they need to. Sometimes they have to move the balconies up and down or make them shorter in order to maintain the sight lines. They approximately have a sight like this. There's high line. High line has uh, is columns, so well maybe it's a two-story structure, I, I, I forgot exactly what it looks like, it might be something like this. I think, it, yeah, it sits on a slab right on the ground, the thickness Is it one level or two levels? Uh, it's like one that. level, it's uh, 27 feet at the top, the girders are approximately seven feet deep in our location. Okay, so it's basically, you're saying that it's Typically, it is like this. Yeah. yeah it, and this is 27 feet. Uh, this picture has changed for this site because of the development on this site. They have removed the foundations. They are going to, because what happens if you have a building like this? All the weight of the building, all everything is coming down to the foundation. This foundation must sit on soil. You cannot start digging next to it like this to say, oh, I want to have a, I want to build a basement. If you dig next to a foundation, as this one pushes down, that footing is going to whip, go that way, and the whole thing is going to collapse. So what they do, they come in and first shore it. The world is shoring. Basically means temporarily supported by other means. And once they have the, the loads on these shoring towers, there is no weight coming down. They go and they start digging the found, 
digging the soil and they remove the foundation and you have seen the pictures that uh, Carol sent me some pictures of the site that columns are all hanging and everything below them is all open to the level of the new basement. What they would later on will do, they are going to build the <coughs> set of new columns and <coughs> on top of new columns they are going to put a new beam and this beam will replace the uh, footing that uh, existed before. So I've got it right behind you. See, all of these are temporary shoring towers, right? They will be eventually taken out. But here is the main column that comes in, and this rusted part is the part that was initially below ground, and there was a footing underneath that. They kept all of these because later on when they build the final foundation, they are going to uh, put a beam uh, under this to support this uh, high line, and they remove all the shoring towers. Here's the thing that I want to talk about. Always when you design a building, your building is going to interact with its neighbors. How far can you interact with your neighbors? Can you put your loads on the neighbor's walls? Can you touch neighbor's walls? Can you undermine their footing? These are some of the important rules that you have to keep in mind when you are designing any building. At some point, your building here is going to interact with the high line. You want people who are walking on the high line to be able to have a bridge and come to your building. So you might even line up your floors with the high line. You should. Okay? And every design is different. Maybe you have a ramp here that at, some, at one point it touches the high line, but uh, and the section beyond it goes lower or higher. These are all factors that are coming into your design. But what happens here? Can I connect my floor to the high line and put my load on that structure? There are special cases. There are special cases. When you get the special rights, you can incorporate an existing building into your building and you can connect them. That way, you may have to go and reinforce the existing columns to put additional load. But generally, generally speaking, we leave a little gap between an existing building and a, this little gap will allow, with the proper cover here, will allow people to go back and forth. But the buildings are not touching each other. We call this structural separation, okay? It is very common to see there is a column here for the high line or for an existing building, and right next to it, you have another column. Why there are two columns right next to each other? Because that column is supporting its own building, your column is, support, is going to support your own building. In this case, foundation of the existing foundation of the high line does not seem to be a problem, but if that development had not happened. You add a column here, your column cannot go like this and say, oh, I'm going to excavate right next to it, go down to build my foundation like that. Because that excavation can make your neighbor's building unstable. When you run into situations like this, these are special considerations. We have to provide temporary shoring for the neighbor's building so that the neighbor's building does not fall down because of our construction. In summary, about this point, what I wanted to say is that when you locate your building, you are going to look at the location of the high line columns, high line beams. Do not generally rely on them and say, okay, here I have a column, I put a beam to go to that one. Do not do that. Provide your own independent column system so that your building is independent of the high line. What happens if five years somebody comes and decides that they want to change the high line? You don't want your building to be demolished in that time, 
right? So if you have a flow graph, it generally needs its own columns to march along there. Sometimes it makes sense to put the new columns right next to the existing column because otherwise if you put the new column a little bit away, physically you have this obstacle, this obstacle, this obstacle, so suddenly it looks like a lot of columns. But if you line up the columns, instead of having these two, you come and you say, I, I'll remove them and I'll put this column to line up with that. Then they hide behind each other. They have less of an impact on your circulation, lighting, and everything else. Okay? The last thing, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, this is uh, by nature short, I'll be afraid of like jumping from topic to topic. Uh, later on, don't hesitate if you have questions, stop by and talk to me. Uh, discuss your plans after my R320 class, we can talk about this. I want to mention something quickly about interior columns and exterior columns. So here is an interior column. What do you consider when you are placing an interior column? Fireproofing, as far as the architectural design. What is important for this column? You don't want that column to be in the middle of the room. You don't want this to be in the middle of a corridor. The placement is important, right? You don't want this thing to suddenly disappear at the floor below. So continuity is important. There are certain things that we consider for the interior columns, but generally it is easy once you place them there. The exterior columns, structurally what does this column do? Beams and girders frame into this and the load goes down, vertically goes down. Like the columns that you see here, beams, frame into that and then their weight goes vertically down. Exterior column does one more thing. Especially if in section, here is the building, here is a entrance floor, and then you have a floor here. Suddenly I have a tall floor here. So this is one floor, here is roof, and this is ground level. What did I create here? This is an open space. What kind of forces are acting on this? Well, weight of roof is coming, going down this column. Definitely I have the dead load and live load from roof are going down. More important than that is wind load. Wind load. Why do I say the, weight, uh, the wind force is more important than the weight of the building that's sitting on the column? The roof can be very, uh, roof can be very heavy. Regardless of that, wind load is a lot more uh, critical. Here is a column that I, why do I am so concerned about wind load? You can put a lot of columns that are taking compression, gravity load, along the axis of a member. That is a very efficient way to resist load. This member is strong. As soon as you put a little bit of sideways, this starts bending. I cannot break this piece by pushing down on it, but I can break it by bending it. Bending, bending is more critical behavior. Bending, any, any force that causes columns or walls or beams to bend is more critical than the force that is pushing them down. 
because of this, this column cannot be a thin member like this thing that I mentioned. How do I create thickness for these outside columns? In our class, a 320 class, when we talked about um, windows, we are going to show pictures, examples of different columns from San Francisco International Airport or from local buildings that you will see these columns along the edge of the building. They need to be usually big and fat. The problem with a big and fat column is that it's going to ruin your atrium. You want to have atrium with lots of light. Sometimes they put glass facade here because they want nice views. If you come and put a big and fat column here, suddenly ruins the view. So the design of these members, it becomes an, an interesting issue. We have examples of columns that are, like in San Francisco International Airport, they use columns that are like white flanges, a white flange column like um, like this. section or an axon? Uh, I was trying to draw it perfectly. So uh, in, uh, in elevation, the column looks, uh, San Francisco International Airport, in elevation, the column looks like this. It's a white flange. This thing, you stand here. This is the scale of a person standing next to it. But a section looking down is looks somewhat like this. So they make it narrow but fat. And this thing is about 50, 60 feet tall. Another approach, you go to Moscone Center West on 4th Street here. They have a large atrium and they have exactly the same problem. <coughs> They need fat columns. But they, this is agent, they want to be very open. In that case, they put a vertical column here, and then they use a series of cable supported members. So in Moscone Center, there is a column outside and a truss shape of members that. Uh, these are thin wires that make a truss. What is important in all of these cases, you need depth. Why do I need depth? Because you do not want a column that is taking window to look something that thin. It has to be, it has to have depth. This is going to impact when you draw the plans. Sometimes the students show me their projects and they show a large atrium. And right here they show, I say, what is this thing? He says, glass wall. And how thick is this glass wall? Well, glass is only one inch thick, so that's one inch thick. No, no, for supporting that glass, you need columns that are, if they are tall, they need to be deep. So suddenly that is a completely different view of atrium than having the one inch thick. How do I estimate, and the word is estimate, how do I estimate the depth? How do I estimate the depth of this? This thing is 
acting just like a beam. A beam, if you turn it 90 degrees, we look like this. For beam, what did I say about the relationship between the span? Over 20. That is a simple rule. That will allow you to draw something that is more or less realistic. So let's say this span here is 60 feet. The height of the atrium that you. What width do I need approximately here? Three feet, 36 inches. Now, he might have a design that says, can I get away with 32 inches? Yeah, 32 inches, 36 inches. You can have small variation, but you cannot go to two inches. Okay, guys, I need to run because there's another class that I have to go. You were my guinea pigs. <laughs> I have to go and say exactly the same thing to the next class. But, uh, if you, have a, if you have a question, please stop by. This was a little bit uh, too condensed and too rushed. I apologize for that. Uh, oh, no worries.